Good afternoon, everyone. What's going on? How y'all doing? All right, all right, all right, all right. Hope you guys got something to drink. It's hot outside. Everybody's feeling okay? You guys good? Everybody's good? Okay, cool, cool. So, um, this room feels really small for me to use a microphone, but I'm assuming because of media, I'll, I'll, use, I'll try to like not boom my voice. I'm used to being on the stage, so like I'm usually like loud. Um, so I'll try to tone it down a little bit. Um, I want to thank Fatso and Shoko for having me here. As you heard the introduction, my name is The Hired Gun. My government name is Mikhail Amin Lee. I'm a hip hop artist, educator, and writer uh, based out of Brooklyn, New York. Um, in addition to me uh, basically traveling and performing my music with my, uh, my imprint Fresh Roots Music, which I'll talk a little bit about later, um, I'm also the program director for a non-for-profit in the United States called Urban Word. We work with youth providing free um, spoken word and hip-hop workshops during after school and also arts programming inside uh, schools in the New York City kind of tri-state area. So. What Shogo asked me to talk about today was this state of hip-hop. And basically what I really want to just kind of just go through over the next 45 minutes or so um, is just kind of basically see what that means and where we're at with that. Um, so we're just, gonna, we're just gonna keep it moving. I don't know if you can see this quote very well, but there is an artist, raise your hand if you've heard of Most Def. That's what, I love it, great, Black Star, yeah? Okay, cool, so this is, this is beautiful. So you, you might, you might uh, know this quote, uh, quote when you hear it. It's uh, from, the, uh, from the song Fear Not of Man, it's the first song off of Black on Both Sides. Um, and when I first heard that album in 99, 2000, I just left school and I affectionately referred to it for me as the Bible. At that time I thought Most Def was gonna be like the next rock hit, he, I really believed he was gonna do it. Um, so it, it goes like this, it's like, so yo most, what's getting ready to happen with hip-hop? Where do you think hip-hop is going? I tell them, you know what's gonna happen with hip-hop? Whatever happening with us. If we smoked out, hip-hop's gonna be smoked out. If we doing all right, hip-hop's gonna be doing all right. People talk about hip-hop like it's some giant living in the hillside coming down to visit the townspeople. We are hip-hop. Me, you, everybody, we are hip hop. So hip hop is going where we going. So the next time you ask yourself where hip hop is going, ask yourself, where am I going? How am I doing? And um, I kind of take it to heart when I think about that question, like the current state of hip hop, and we've been talking about it, Nakala talked about it a couple of days ago. It's kind of been a discussion just in general, just kind of um, around that, essentially, Whatever is really kind of happening in society, what's happening kind of in the day to day seems to be the reflection of what hip hop seems to be doing. Um, you know, it seems to have multiple meanings. It's, it's something that, even with when you talk about the history of it and the origins of it, it's become so much more to so many different people all across, um, all across the world. So, you know, again, you ask that question. Chopped and screwed, East Coast, Underground, Dirty South, Trap Music, the Four Elements, Hyphy, Hip Life, Conscious, Independent, Bling. Um, it means a lot of different things, it seems, to a lot of different people. And I feel if you want to talk about the current state of it, we have to kind of first get at kind of what it might mean. Um, so I guess, you know, what do you guys think when you hear the word hip hop? Just like shout out, just real quick, just anything. Like when you hear the word hip hop, like what does it mean to you? What do you think? Expression. Expression. Life. Life. Truth. Truth. Culture. Culture. Okay. So clearly, I've missed a few, um, and that's and that is kind of indicative of what I kind of wanted to show is that, you know, hip hop seems to mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Now, this is the, the international Shogo Festival, it's their inaugural one, so I know their budget wasn't very large, so I couldn't bring everybody I wanted to bring with me, but I figured I'd bring them this way. So, I asked a few people, actually before My it starts. Andre Raffi. Before it starts, I figured it wouldn't make any sense for me to just talk about what I thought the current state of hip hop is, I'm one person. Um, 
And I actually, at the end of this, I want to kind of talk to you all about where you are from and what you know of the hip hop where you're at to kind of get a, a broader perspective. Because I think that one of the worst things that we've done, and what I try not to do, is that we always want to hear about what basically the West or what America thinks of hip hop. And in my travels, I've been to Europe, I've been to Brazil, now I'm in Africa. Hip hop has been in these places, in some of these places, 25 years. So clearly they have an understanding or an idea of what hip hop is. It's just that I've just had the, the, the fortune of being in the city or being in the, in the country with a bigger megaphone than most. But that doesn't make what I think of what the state of hip hop is any more relevant or any more important. You know what I mean? So with that, but the little thing is though, I figured I would like to get some other perspectives from people that I do. Some of these people are producers, some of these people are simply just fans, um, media people, DJs. So I'm probably not gonna go through everyone, but I figured it would be cool to just kind of hear what other people are, are, are thinking, what they think what the current state of hip hop is. Um, so here we go. Tim, uh, mastering engineer, Base Camp Recordings, New York, New York, worldwide. Uh, info at basecamprecordings.com if you need music done. Um, Wait a minute, I'm gonna bring him back just a little bit. If anybody's wondering, that is my apartment. It is messy. That's why I did headshots. I didn't want you know. We independent with this. We didn't have no movie studio. We just did it. My name is Andre Raffington, uh, mastering engineer, Base Camp Recordings, New York, New York, worldwide. Uh, info at basecamprecordings.com if you need music done. Um, I guess the question is what the state of hip hop is, and honestly, the state is in confusion. Um, hip hop is not what it is, what it was, and what it can be. Um, you know, everyone wants to worry about the weekend, but once the weekend's over, what's left? And I think a lot of people in hip hop forget that hip hop was used to spread knowledge to people about things that were going on in either the local neighborhood or just the world in general. And for people who didn't have access to certain information, that was how we got it. Um, everyone knows how to uh, put on some cologne, everyone knows how to uh, get a girl, everyone knows how to get drunk, um, but, uh, you know, people don't know what China's, you know, jet to uh, GDP ratio is and how that's important, or how things that are going on affect them more than they know, and unfortunately all hip-hop artists are worried about is how many records they're selling, and they're worried about how many diamonds that they have, and that's not really important. Oh, top from the bush is the name Flatbush Brooklyn. Find me at tileonline.com. I'm an MC from Brooklyn, New York. Word. What up? What up, worldwide? So, this is how I'm going to say it, man. Hip hop to me is in a state of beautiful disarray. Um, it's beautiful because it is an art form in its purest form. It's in disarray because. There's other things trying to mutate it, other things actively mutating it, um, naturally mutating it, and then there's the man who's kind of manipulating the machine, and it's kind of in disarray. So it's kind of in this uh, malleable, amorphous type of uh, type of mode right now, where people just don't exactly know how to describe it. A lot of people say hip hop is dead. I don't think that hip hop is dead. I think hip hop is quite alive. But I think that there are things poking and pulling at it that, that just kind of fuck with it. So, um, there's a lot of things watering down hip hop. A lot of people don't understand that there's a difference between rap music and hip hop music. And, and uh, rap music tends to, to, to have this mask over hip hop music. And, Call itself hip hop, and uh, because people are part of hip hop culture, does not mean that that uh, their music is hip hop music. There's cats that that, that do this rap stuff that, that don't exactly make it hip hop. And uh, to me, it's in a state of disarray. It's a very dangerous state, but it's also a very creative state. Crystal clarity speaks. As another question, like when someone else was speaking, my, the thought that came to my head was, well, no one's asking about what's the state of women in hip hop. And I say women are not females because female is a very broad category. A woman is a human being. So women in hip hop still represented as bitches. Yeah. 
think mirrors a little bit of the current state of music business, entertainment as a whole. I think it's in a state of evolution. Uh, I think there's a lot of things changing uh, from the ground level to the corporate level. So hip hop, you know, started on the ground, still, still exists on the ground level, so to speak. I think that it's uh, obviously taking off. Uh, it's a worldwide culture, a worldwide business. You know, so there's commerce, there's culture, it's a lot of aspects. So I think what we're seeing, what we're seeing, you know, and what we're chronicling um, in the workplace of hip hop, movement that maybe has always been here, but maybe has certain opportunities to uh, create for themselves, whereas the corporatization of hip hop has not always allowed that. Right. Um, so I think that the state of hip hop, because it's so multifaceted, it's really hard to, to pinpoint. This is Brian K, Arrow MC, and the Ground Jungle MC. The state of hip hop right now stands mainstream, public on. It's good, but, you know, from what I grew up with, it's not quite the same. It's a different type of mainstream, it's a different type of civil. I miss my Run DMC. I want more old school, Jay-Z, I want the Q-Tip, Buster Rock's still there, he's doing his thing, I want the Lord and stuff from back in the day. I don't know, right now, it's like, I can't say that I'm not inspired to go out there and just stop something heavy. I listen to these guys, I'm like, damn, you just really want to dance or you just want to sit there and nod their head or you just want to sit there and just... It's definitely expanded. You got nerdcore hip hop, you got your commercial, you got like, you know, different whatever types of hip hop. Hip hop is, you know, blended with rock, blended with reggae, blended with everything. So that's cool. Some of it I think is a little disappointing to see, like some of it. But some of it is great because it makes up for it. Um, I think some of the best hip hop, a lot of people are never going to hear because it's not, it doesn't get the. Uh, the spread that I think it deserves to get. Um, I don't know what that means, but <laughs> I believe that they were on point. some of the some of the best stuff is, is very underground and just you know isn't out there and shown to the people. Um, unfortunately, I think money has taken away some of the best parts of hip hop, and uh, because the the game is money, it's kind of you know watered and changed into something. I can't really admire as much, but that's, that goes for all music. There's a lot of music that I feel has been changed to something that it wasn't originally for the, the purpose of making money. But I mean, the fact that people in other countries don't even speak English love it. People, I've heard Japanese hip hop, I've heard African, I've heard so many different countries rapping. And I don't know what the hell they're saying, but I love it. They're on B. Even if they're not on B, they're just so into it. And I love it. It's, it's become this worldwide phenomenon. I love it. Yo, I go by the name of M Tri, Max Parker Villas, I'm a triple threat on the set, MC, DJ, producer, both in New York. Um, I feel the current state of hip hop is actually really, really dope. You know, if we're talking about hip hop, the state of hip hop is really dope. We got MCs, B boys, B girls, DJs, producers, B boxes, all over the world at this point. You know, like. 10 years ago, it was starting to get that far, but I mean, maybe even a little bit before that, 15 years ago, it was spread out, but we really have a unique thing right now with hip hop, because it's, it's really all over the world now. Something that started in the late 70s and didn't really get off its feet until the late 80s is actually worldwide right now. Uh, the last, I guess, genre of music, if you want to call it that, uh, but it's a culture, you know. As far as all of these different things, and it's very clear, like, the more voices you hear, the more kind of confusing it seems because, you know, some people on that, on the video, and I, I know there's a little a background noise with the, with the street, but some of the people were talking about hip-hop being completely commercial. Others were talking about hearing international hip-hop and how that was a, a great and positive thing. So they're talking about the diversity of it. And then even the last individual, um, DJ M-Tribe, was talking about how he thinks it's great. 
Um, so if you even just ask, just to, if you just throw a bunch of pennies into a crowd and then ask them to talk to you about the currency of hip hop, they might, they might say a couple of different things. Um, my personal definition um, that I've kind of come up with, and this is more of kind of like the, uh, the Oxford Dictionary version, so. Um, hip hop to me, it's a traditional African diasporic culture derived from four primary ritual practices, break, rhyme, uh, graph, and DJing, created and demonstrated originally as a direct response to oppressive forces exerted on poor people of color within the urban ghettos of the United States, but its unique and inclusive nature has expanded its impact and influence worldwide, um, which means it spans culture, spans genders, et cetera, et cetera. But beyond the definition, I do think you can kind of look at two main themes or tracks to kind of like talk about this a little. Um, so for me, the state of hip hop, you can't talk about the state of hip hop without looking at the music industry. And we all know what that is, record labels, distribution, media, videos, concerts, things of that nature. And then obviously the cultural, the language, the styles, the innovations. But well, we're going to talk about the music industry first because that's something that um, I think for us here at this hip hop festival is the most important because many of us are independent artists, not signed, or if we are signed, or signed to smaller labels. Um, I don't think there's any major artists here, um, or ma major label artists rather, um, that are here. Um, and there is this sense that hip hop's being lost, hip hop's dead. People just want to hear people talking about bling or guns or whatever the stereotypes may be that hip hop's kind of become. And where are the real MCs? Or where are the conscious MCs? Or where is the art and the art form aspect of it? But we're going to talk a little bit about that because I think the perception that the West kind of puts out is sort of an illusion, and I'll show you how. Here's a couple of statistics. Really quick. I'm not really a big statistic guy. I really believe like you can have one statistic say one thing and you can find something that says something else. But since 2000, rap sales dropped 44% and declined to 10% of all music sales, which while still a commanding figure when compared to other genres, is a significant drop from the 13% of all music sales where rap music is regularly placed. From 1997, which isn't on here, from like 1997 to 2000, rap literally dominated music uh, sales. Uh, it was it was well over, it was almost like 75%, it was something crazy like that. Um, between 2005, 2006, the rap sales um, have fallen 20%, 21%, and these are major label figures, but they are label figures based on worldwide sales. In other words, we're not talking about just US sales. This is what the record labels internationally worldwide are talking about, their whole sales. Um, and I say major label because what's not included in this, and we're gonna get to that, are digital and independent labels. And independent labels can also be described as individuals like myself, who essentially are sole, uh, sole proprietors. And, and I don't want to pick crazy legal terms, but essentially like, I'm the label. There is no staff, there is no building. It's literally me producing and distributing my music. And again, I'm gonna get a little bit into that in a second. Um, so real quick, total number of albums sold in 2010, 326 million was the lowest since SoundScan began compiling the data in 1993. 326 million, again, that is the number specifically for hip hop music, major labels, and that's a kind of impressive number, honestly, to me. So imagine if that's a, a drop, what it was 10 years ago. Um, but this has the record label scared. They're freaking out right now. They're completely, absolutely freaking out. Um, total album sales dropped off nearly 13% when measured against sales in 2009. That's the same rate of decrease since 2008. So what you're basically seeing here is that there's just a gradual decline in the sales. However, with all of that said, there are a few people making some money, making some noise. Drake, certified platinum, Lil Wayne, certified triple platinum in the last three years, 2008, 2011. Yay and Jay, of course. Um, Dark Twisted Fantasy just this year, just reached a million copies. Um, Blueprint 3, same thing, over a million copies this past year. And then their latest watch, The Throne, probably as of right now, is Platinum. Um, Eminem, we all know. As the, my man, uh, me and Chico were talking about Eminem before, and, and you know, as bad as recovery was, for you, I liked it, but 
you know, it still sold 3.5 mil. Um, that's really a testament to the power of his fan base and what he's done his career prior. Uh, and then last but not least, surprisingly, Nicki Minaj, 1.5. What's very interesting also about this is that she's the only woman. And literally, right now, in major media, she is the only female that's really getting any type of shine representation. Um, how many people do you, anybody know Nicki Minaj here? Okay. Okay, so you, you know what type of music she has. Okay. And we also know, yeah, 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 yeah okay. Uh, I, I tried to pick the least revealing picture I could possibly find, if you know anything about Nicki Minaj. Yeah, you know, it, come on, fellas, come on. We'll do that later, later, later. Um, but, uh, so, here's the thing that they all have in common, though, at least from, from what I see. It's style over substance. What you've seen in the last 25 years has hip hop's narrowed its focus. It's narrowed the narratives, it's narrowed the genre down. Um, there was a time when you'd have a, pub, you'd have a tour with Public Enemy, Ice Cube, NWA and Digital Underground. Um, if any of these names sound familiar, just say hell yeah. Hell yeah. Okay, so you got the Humpty Hump, you got Shock G with a big nose on, doing some comedy, Public Enemy's Black Militant, Ice Cube and, Ice, and, and NWA will probably shoot you. You know, so you had gangster, you had political, you had just entertainment. And all of this music was actually going on at the same time, it was getting the same type of play. You had radio stations like 98.7, uh, 107.5, so you would hear a whole range of hip hop. So the opportunity for an artist to be original and be themselves was there. But sometime around 1995, 94, 95, um, the industry began to change. And what we've seen is a narrowing of what the mainstream will uh, present. So now you had to be a little rougher, your watch a little shinier, your car a little bigger, your woman's waist a little smaller, the jeans tighter or no jeans at all. And that has been kind of what the mainstream is focused on over the last 20, 25 years with the peak of their sales happening in 2000. And then suddenly something began to happen and sales started to drop. Now, there's a lot of different reasons for it, and a lot of people also know that with digital technology, with the rise of places like Napster, um, and just the ability for individuals to essentially get music for free, people began to just say, well, I'm just gonna go take it. I'm just gonna just go pick it up and, and take it off the internet. I'll be on a blog somewhere and I'll just take it. But I really think if you look deeper, because there are still artists that continue to sell records independently in the numbers of the hundreds and two hundred thousands with no distribution deal, um, with no major radio play, with no media or label support, and still continue to sell hundreds of thousands of records um, worldwide. Uh, people like, uh, let's see, um, Moral Technique, Luby Fiasco, even, even some of the, the, uh, the older uh, what well, we consider older, but you know, golden era artists are continuing to tour. We were talking about Wu Tang before. I think part of, maybe part of, the reason why some of these sales have been declining is because individuals got tired of hearing the same thing for 20 years. If you've heard the story once and it was an okay story the first time you heard it, or you got it the first time, do you really want to hear it for 20 some odd years? I think what the decline in sales shows is that people are kind of sort of getting tired a little bit of the same thing. So they might be looking for other, uh, other styles, other forms, maybe even other musics. But the, the, the industry is still kind of stuck in the same model as before because it had generated so much sales. And they haven't really come up and figured out a way to either change the model on how they're going to promote or present or they really just don't really have a desire to really kind of reach out and go find a new set of individuals to essentially promote. Which is really fine by me, to be honest with you, because I'm sitting here um, at this festival right now with some amazing artists, and I'm in Africa, and I've been other places, so I represent, in a certain degree, and by no means the, the, the main represent, representation, but there is a, an ability for independent artists in a market to essentially 
be viable and thrive and be able to continue to produce music and get that music heard and get out there. So, these are the ways. These are what I call the great equalizers. And this is what I was gonna break down talking about Fresh Roots music. So, we all know Facebook, correct? I think I've friended a bunch of you actually while I've been here, so. Um, Twitter and blogs, we just saw Zimbo Jam, the website, um, an another great example. Um, and these things, essentially now, that's your marketing arm. That's your PR right there. That costs you zero dollars. What it does cost is time, and that's one of the difficulties. But the reality of it is, is that like no other time before, because before 1995, there was no internet. <laughs> so, you know, essentially, if you wanted to have someone hear your music or you wanted to be heard, you had to go to a radio station, give them a piece of vinyl or maybe a CD, and then they would play it on the radio. If you didn't have a way to have money where you could take, and I've done this, when I was in college, my first EP, me and my DJ, what we literally did was we took CDs, we put them in manila folders, we put a little like press junket that we typed up, put it in a manila envelope, and found out all of these different college radio stations addresses, wrote a nice little letter like, hey, we're so-and-so, here's ESP crew, blah, 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 check our music, blah, 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 sent out 30, 40, 50 of those. But like... That was basically all of the money that I had from my little job that I was uh, working in college. So I can do that times a thousand by basically taking something like SoundCloud or Bandcamp, putting it on Twitter, putting it to my 5,000 friends, linking it to a blog, and then all of a sudden that work's done like that. And I spent absolutely no money. What's really important about it is so. I've, in the, last, in the last three years, Fresh Roots Music has produced my, my solo album, um, a compilation, and I'm actually working on, on my second album. Whatever monies that I get from shows, touring, any possible residuals, all that basically goes into is just actually producing the record for producers, for production, engineering, um, packaging. So really on a label level, the only thing that I'm actually paying for in terms of support right now is essentially just the music itself, the product itself. So there's your PR arm. You can go to home studios. Ableton, M Audio Reason, you guys were using uh, Fruity Loops. Um, Ill Immigrants, you guys are gonna hear later, really, really ridiculous, ridiculous artists. They actually brought me upstairs and they literally had their studio sitting right there. And it was crazy because my albums and my first solo album actually got me recognized um, in Herb Magazine's 2009 Up and Coming Artists. Um, in that list was Drake, Sky Zoo, um, and who was the other? Asheroth, that was the other one. Amongst the hundred that were recognized. Now mind you, Drake, Asheroth, and Sky Zoo are all signed to major labels. I'm Fresh Fruits Music. <laughs> So the fact that I could even get my music heard by a major magazine in the United States, and then for them to listen to that music that essentially put me on a list with all of these major label artists is a testament to the fact that I have the ability to compete, at least on a small level, with myself getting heard. This is why labels are scared, and essentially this is really why labels are starting to decline in their impact. Because now you have the democracy of artists being able to take control of their music, take control of the production, and then produce that. So even on a local level, you have the ability to create create and generate fan base like never before. Even if you were just dealing with your own city, you would still have to go to whatever radio stations were within that city and physically give them music. Um, in the United States, there was a particular act that occurred. It was the Information, I think it was the Information Act of 1995, which essentially deregulated media. I let you know that to know this. It used to be there were radio stations throughout the United States that were independent. They basically were their own entity. If you were in Oakland, there was a local Oakland radio station. That was the DJ. He played what he wanted. He didn't have to talk to anyone to do so. He would go to shows, concerts, whatever. People would bring him stuff. He'd play what he wanted. There were also labels, of course, too, that would music. What ended up happening is, is that in 1995, there's a, if you know the name of this company, um, raise your hand. Have you ever heard of Clear Channel? Okay, you've heard of Clear Channel, okay. So just so that Clear Channel basically is a media conglomerate. It is a mass corporation that has many different types of holdings and all different types of things. But one of the major holdings they have is music. So what did they do in between 1995 and 2000? They bought up something like 80 or 90% of the radio market, which means that most radio stations in the United States are owned by Clear Channel. What this means was, 
they in turn also do um, tour promotion. So they basically have made deals with the major labels and create playlists. So now if you're a DJ, it doesn't matter if you're in Oakland or New York or Boston or a suburb somewhere, you get a playlist as a DJ and that's what you play. So if you go to the United States, and I, I suspect it's probably similar here in Africa and other places, when you go on the radio, you'll probably hear in the span of an hour the same four artists. I had a tour um, that I was on um, in support of uh, an album that we're gonna talk about a little bit later and I was driving to it myself. It was a four hour drive in New York and I did a little experiment. I never listened to the radio. I haven't listened to the radio since I was like 17. I just don't listen to it anymore. Um, when I do listen to it, it's mostly because when I'm working with my teenagers, this makes me sound really, really old, but when I'm working with my youth, I have to know what they're listening to because if I'm gonna talk to them about music, it sounds stupid if I'm, you know, Drake sucks, but I don't even know what Drake's song. Like, I should be able to understand what they're listening to if I'm gonna ask them to critique it myself, or themselves. I need to be able to see it. I just can't say it, it's bad. I have to explain why I think there might be something better they wanna to listen to, or even just to have the dialogue, period. So, on this trip, in the span of four hours, same radio station, Hot 97, I heard four artists, Drake, Nicki Minaj, Jay-Z, Kanye West. I counted three songs a piece, four artists, for a consecutive hour for four hours. That sounds like hypnosis to me. I don't know about you. I think if you hear something over and over and over and over and over again, you start to believe it, right? That's the, that is the, the state of major um, label or mainstream rap music as it stands, and I suspect it's not just a, a Western phenomenon, but because of the interest that places like uh, Sony, which is owned by Vivendi, which is a French waste management company, you're getting, if you're not getting the same artist we are, you're getting a, 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 a clone of the same thing, and then that's being sold to you in the same way. Um, I don't, I suspect that there's not the same level of diversity of artists as you hear on your major radio. Um, please correct me if, I, if I'm wrong. Um, but going back again to uh, the home studio, so essentially, as I was talking with, with Ill Immigrant, it was crazy because I'm watching him with his Fruity Loops and his, his computer. I have the exact same thing in my house. I have an M Audio M Box 2, which all it is is an external sound card, which means you plug your microphone in, it plugs into your computer, and then whatever software you have to kind of record yourself, it runs. Because of that, now, instead of me going to a record st recording studio that might cost anywhere between ten and $15,000, which, if you're signed to a label, you owe them because they pay for it and they just bill you later, which is why you ultimately don't make money as an artist because you're basically paying back the label for everything they do. Remember back before I said PR marketing is free for me. Well, all promotion that a major label artist has is essentially paid for by the label, but they don't pay for that, you do. You just pay for it later because when they sell your record, instead of you getting paid first, you get paid last you essentially take out a loan. What this has done is said, I don't need a loan. I have my own small business, and I don't make the loan to myself. So now I have production, which is not necessarily free because these do cost. Ableton is a program that costs, have audio is a, a device that costs, but significantly less. I put my studio together for less than $1,000. Now take that when you're talking about $150 to $200 for a top studio in the United States per hour. Um, it took me about two and a half years to write my record. I think the recording took anywhere between four to six months at an average of four to six hours a session. That's just the recording. I didn't talk about mixing or mastering. You pay for all of that by hour. What if you can literally do that yourself where you have a crew where one's an engineer, one's a producer, one's a DJ, the other's an MC. That's all free. Uh, labor's all free. And I know crews that do that. I know crews that have literally, I don't have that. I, I do pay for engineering and mastering, but I literally know crews that it's just, they have every step of production from the producer making the record to the engineer mixing and mastering it. So they pay for nothing. So the only thing you're really paying for is to make this. It's a physical CD. So now that might come to like, in a, in a, in a, again, I know I'm talking about more Western terms, so I apologize, I don't want to assume that it's all the same pricing, but in terms of West, this, just pressing this and packaging it, about $2,000. So you think about that, 
ten to fifteen thousand dollars for the studio, and, and I'm being generous. It's probably upwards of more like one hundred and fifty to two hundred thousand when you're talking about producing an entire record. Um, so that's all free. More PR, Reverb Nation Bandcamp, both free. Um, they basically work similar to Zimbo Jam. It's essentially through advertising they make their money. So the artist can sign up for free. My email list. So if you like my music and I see you later, and you're like, oh, you're dope, you're dope, you're dope. I get your email. I put it on this, Reverb Nation, boom. Every time I have a show, every time I have a release, I send you an email. You're now on my fan base. Now I have a virtual fan club. I can get all of the news about what I'm doing, where I'm at in the world. In fact, everybody that I filmed and talked with is going right on my blog, going right to my Reverb Nation, and everybody's going to see my tour. More marketing. It's all free. Obviously, of course, you know, the things that I have to pay for, like the flip video camera that I have, or the digital camera you have. But again, that's like pennies on the dollar compared to hiring a PR marketing firm. And um, one of my records, we were trying to do that, and it was something like, um, I think it was like $5,000 for three months of like marketing, where basically what they do is they, uh, they send out blasts to different digital blogs, and then they also do like, you know, the, the stereotypical calling up radio stations and college campuses and things like that, and they have a package that they present for you. And it's really, what you pay for is not necessarily the labor, you pay for the contacts. So they will be able to, instead of you sending your CD to the intern, they can talk to like the director of sales or like the program director himself. Because that's what happens a lot, of, that used to happen a lot of times too. If you weren't signed to a major label, let's say Ill Immigrants comes to America and they're doing their thing and they got their record and they find out about, oh, I'm gonna send to the Hot 97. Well, you don't know who the program director is, you just have the address. So when they see it's like Ill Immigrant, they look it up like, oh, we don't, they're not on Sony, they're not on Interscope, yeah, okay, whatever. And I'm, I'm serious, I have, I have friends in the industry that literally what happens. Because in order for them to make money, they have to monopolize it. So they're not gonna really let other artists in necessarily. The artists that have been able to break through independently and then become major label artists, people like Birdman, Master P, Jay-Z, essentially what they did first is they created a buzz underground. They created a fan base of the ground where it's like, you had to pay attention to them because when the program director walks out of his door, his daughter's like, yo, did you hear about Jay-Z? And you look foolish, so then you have to go and like, okay, well, we gotta talk to this guy. And that's literally what happened. Um, Last but not least, Internet Tools, Last.fm, SoundCloud. Last.fm is actually a virtual radio station that you create. You literally have the ability to create a playlist of your music and then run it like a radio station. So now you can even make your own radio station. You can, I can, I can, like, Fresh Roots Music, the label now encompasses full PR marketing street team online, my own radio station, and full production. And most of it, I can, this all, not counting band hours, because I love what I do, so I'm not counting how, I don't, you know, pay myself up by the hour, I'd be doing it anyway. I'd estimate maybe like two to three thousand dollars, and I spend that maybe once every five to six years, because, you know, certain equipment breaks, or you have to update, you know, something like Ableton when they get a new one, or you update Fruity Loops to the new version to get more things. So, this, to me, is the bigger reason why you see this decline in sales, because now, where you had to go to a label to produce music, you no longer have to do that. It's basically the digital state of hip hop. So, we now have the super underground. Um, and, and, I, and I call it the super underground because now the underground doesn't consist of individuals that are in New York City, or Atlanta, or LA, they exist in Harare, they exist in Johannesburg, they exist in Paris, they exist in Berlin, they exist in Porto Alegre, they exist all over the world because all of these tools are available to everyone. It's not as if, like I said, I walked in, you were, you were rocking Fruity Loops, you were talking about reason. So clearly it's not something that is just in one area of the world or one section of the world. These tools have been able to span all over and those of us that have the talent and love hip hop find those things and we use those things because we don't really have much of an alternative. I don't think there's a major label in Zimbabwe, is there? Right. We're not for hip hop. Um, I definitely know there's not one in the Czech Republic where I've toured. Um, I think there's one in Germany, but essentially it's the conglomerate of a Western label, so it's not even really like a German major label. It's just like, the, it's, the, it's the German subsidiary of like a Sony. So it's not really a German label. It's just like Sony's office in Germany. 
Um, but now with, with essentially super underground, we have individuals that are able to not only produce the music very cheaply, but then also present it and promote it. Um, I was hearing about African artists through the organization I also worked for Nomadic Blacks because they had been producing shorts. So before I even got the Harari, I was looking for Cynic. I knew who Aerosol was. I'd seen them already because they had a mini documentary on them. So I'm actually hearing about artists that I'm fortunate enough to meet, but there's people already out there on Facebook right now watching it that might not ever able to physically get to see them. Hopefully they do. But they'll be able to hear them. And when they get to the point where they're able to produce music, then those people will be able to buy it. That is a huge, huge game changer as far as a major label's concerned. Because now you're, you're obsolete, I don't need you. I just need to be as creative and as inventive as, as, creative, as in, inventive as possible. And then most importantly to me, what I call the super underground, is you have to develop community. Because you have to find the individuals that have the different resources. So if your boy doesn't rap, but he's really, really creative with the visual, Boom, there's your art department. If you have a, a, a guy that really, really wants to DJ, but he's not really that dope, but he really knows how to get people to a party, there's your street team. And then all of a sudden, suddenly, you start building a fan base. But you can't really do it with like one or two people. Even though I, I call myself Fresh Roots Music and it's just me, the, the truth of the matter is, I do have many other individuals that help me promote and push stuff. My producer, Zach Kwan, my DJ, Mayday, that help produce the actual physical records and help engineer things. Um, so it's not, it isn't really just me. I just say that, but in truth, there's many people that are helping me, and I'm a part of a larger community of individuals that support and promote each other. One of my good friends, actually was wearing a shirt a couple days ago, Todd from the Bush, he's currently, right now, he's from Flatbush, he was the second dude in the, in the video um, that you saw um, that was worried about, he was cursing. He's currently, right now, on tour in Australia, right now. Um, and we were gonna try to link up to try to do like a Skype thing, but unfortunately I haven't been able to get internet that well, but we've been on Facebook back and forth talking about each other's tours on Facebook. So now the people that like him know about me, like, oh, your boy's in Africa? Oh, you mean your boy's in Australia? And then that same kind of like little illusion magic trick that major labels do, now we have, because now it seems like, yo, these guys are global, they're all over the world. I gotta check these guys out. But that's where the community comes in, because if I like his music, and he likes my music, and we're all in the same scene, it makes more sense, like, well, if you're doing something, and I'm doing something, we need to be pushing each other. The first thing I'm doing when I get back, aside from putting up the stuff with Ill Immigrant and BLO, is I'm gonna tell everybody about a cop, because I had never seen him before, and he's dope. I wouldn't be able to do that in 1996. It wouldn't be the means. So, I don't know, uh, what, what does all of this mean? Well, I think from the, the cultural standpoint, what's been very fortunate for me is that I've been able to travel the world to see many different styles and forms of music. And again, I also think, again, that's one of the reasons why you're seeing this decline in what is sort of like the, the physical state of hip hop. I probably should have put it in quotes because that's kind of how I see major labels, sort of like the state. We're sort of like the underground resistance of that. We're fighting that. We're trying to get under that and get past that. Um, but I think one of the, the other things about it is that when I've, when I've gone overseas and been to, to different areas of the world, the hip hop feels familiar, but it's different. There's still cats rapping. There's cats dancing. You know, I see DJs. But there's always something different and it's not just the language, it's what they use. So this record, this is my, my latest record, it's with my partners. I would, I would consider it a truly international project. So myself and Rabbi Darkside are two MCs from the United States. Um, a DJ from Lyon, France, Zajaza, actually came to the United States basically just to look for artists to work with and, and just basically uh, be in America. His sister lives in Philadelphia. We happen to all meet. Um, over the course of about six months after kind of like collaborating and, and working, he came to both of us and said, hey, I used to work in Brazil, I used to work in southern Brazil, and there's several hip hop crews down in southern Brazil that are doing some things, I have some contacts, we should go. So two months after that, I'm on a plane, and I'm in southern Brazil, and for two weeks I toured, similar to how I'm touring um, in Zimbabwe right now, and while I was there, we hooked up, 
we, uh, we recorded a couple of songs and we produced this album. So this album is being produced by two American MCs, a French DJ, and then two Portuguese um, hip hop acts, a la Pretos do Cor, which is the circle of black men, and in Paso Fundo, the first crew is in Porto Alegre, in Paso Fundo the crew is Ura Escundo. I'm really bad with my Portuguese, I gotta get better with my Portuguese. Um, but it is the union of knowledge and respect. So when we toured with them, we came to the city, did a show, and we would do a track. Actually, we did a couple of tracks in both places. And at the end of the week, we realized, like, we need to do a record. And that's what we did. So the second week, we ended up recording. Now, mind you, again, what I saw upstairs with your crew was what I saw in Paso Fundo. My man literally, this is how, this is what love of hip hop does to you people. You become homeless. So this, this little kid, 16 years old, the crew is about eight people. This kid moved back in with his kid's sister, turned his bedroom into his studio. Egg crates, literally put wood up, made a booth out of it. So he gave up his, he gave up his own room, moved back in with his little sister, who's like, I don't know, six or something like that. It's a small house anyway. Um, he lived in one of the favelas called Southside, so they don't really have a big place anyway. But he essentially gave up his room so that his crew could have a DJ booth. And then they had their computer in there. And I, I, think, I think they were using Fruity Loops too. And we recorded the two songs that you would hear on this album in that studio. The only difference or change is when we came back to the States with the raw files, we obviously got it mixed. But nothing else changed. So the vocals that I recorded in Paso Fundo in that little booth is what you'll hear on that record. Um, but what was really crazy was is that we were doing the cipher. Now normally you've got seen, we've, everybody's probably seen or noticed us kind of all ciphering here in the circle. And you hear somebody beatboxing and rapping. What well, I, I believe they have them, but they don't beatbox really much in South Brazil. But what they do have is this instrument called the biramal. I don't know, has anybody heard of the biramal before? Okay. So it's basically a traditional um, Brazilian instrument. It's usually used when they have a similar cipher, capoeira, which is a Brazilian um, based martial art. So as we're all hanging out and chilling, we have our drinks, and which was very familiarly hip hop. I'm like, okay, I'm chilling with a bunch of MCs, and we drink it. Okay, cool. So this is what you know. I'm waiting for someone to just like start kicking up on a beatbox, and all of a sudden I hear like this like kind of twang, and it's like rhythm. When I look over and I and I've seen a beer about before, so I knew what it was. And these guys just start playing the beer about. Then all of a sudden, dudes just start breaking out, rapping in Portuguese, and that was the cipher. What was so critical for me was, it's like, okay, so we're, we're rapping, we're in a circle. That's very like, okay, regular hip hop, but not that. You're not gonna find somebody in a cypher in Union Square in New York City playing the beer about when you're rapping. It's not happening. That's not American, that's Brazilian. And that's the power of hip hop because hip hop allows you to bring your own cultural artifacts, your own cultural understanding, the own traditions. The Western African artists that I've worked with from Senegal, Musa Sala Wagable from Waterflow, they bring a lot of the traditional dance into their hip hop, as well as certain singing um, aspects that are kind of indicative of like the jellies or the griots in Western Africa that you don't hear in hip hop in America. And Wagable right now, I believe he lives in Switzerland and he tours there. Musa is actually in the United States and he tours around in the United States. Um, what got them the ability to basically be heard and perform and work um, in the United States, but I truly believe is the fact that part of them looks and feels like hip hop, but then the other part is something that is very unique that people could become interested in. Because I think for the last 20 years almost, everybody's had the same idea of what hip hop was. But now you see this new hip hop, you see something different. And that's always been kind of like the, the advantage hip hop had was the innovation. Someone was always coming up with something new, something different, a better way to do it, or their own way of doing it. And for me, that right now is, is somewhat what the current state of hip hop has become. It's these two things, it's sort of like this big castle on the hill that's sort of slowly crumbling. And these people underneath that are finding new ways to basically sustain themselves and actually thrive. But ultimately, I think that when you talk about hip hop, I think depending on where you are, who you're talking to, 
um, it still means something different to everyone. And that's not necessarily a bad thing, because I think that when it's at its, at its best and its positive core, that means that I'm going to hear a traditional instrument um, in the music being sampled. I'm going to hear someone speaking maybe about a piece of folklore from Kenya in their rap. And that's what makes hip hop strong, and that's the reason why it's basically become global. So I, I guess for me, the current state of hip hop is, is somewhat in between, we're kind of in a between state, but I think we're in a better place now than we were, say, 15 years ago. Um, so does anybody have any questions or, or comments? I'd love to, to, to have you guys kind of offer your, your ideas on what you feel the, the current state of hip hop is. <laughs> Thank you. Anyone? Okay, oh, yes. I think uh, basically what you summed up is, uh, as an artist or people involved in hip hop, you have to find ways of being heard, of being seen, of being noticed, <laughs> and using the least uh, amount of money possible, and looking for, for, for <coughs> ingenious ways of trying to get your music and other people to notice you, whether it's YouTube or Facebook or whatnot, and whatever resources you've got, depending on, uh, on, on how you can look at it, you can utilize it to your best of your ability. You are a working label right now, but you know, you can actually use that to actually get a lot of people to know like, even if it's a business card or whatever, wherever you are at, you are an entity. Let's see your t-shirts, let's see your, your CDs and whatnot, you're holding lots of stuff there. It doesn't mean that if you can't get into the shops, you can't get a lot of people to notice you and see what you are doing. Because if people notice you, you've got a higher chance of you know, getting something out of it than when people don't even know that you exist. So it's basically now that the world is more technological, you have to find ways obviously of trying to get into that market. But if you're in Zoom and you can see that maybe internet and whatnot is not working, you just come out to all the, the spots where people are doing stuff and, and put your stuff out. Eventually, you know, there's a lot of people traveling and doing sorts of things. You will have a fan base before you know it. If you can just try and be seen. I think that is some of the... Yeah, that's what totally agree. Totally agree. Yeah, um, I think the state of hip hop right now calls for responsibility because because first hip hop is hip hop and hip hop is music and if it's music then it, then it's art and we perceive things differently. Um, the monkey nuts and ill England are not going to talk about the same thing. So so whatever it is in your head, you just have to be responsible. What, what are you going to say and what are you going to do and you know, you have to make sure you're doing the right thing and you have to, you have, you have to see it as that, not as to, as, as in containing it into a box, you know, where we, where we, where we, where we are, where we're being activist about certain things, whatever, you can just talk about whatever you want to talk about and whether you're being, you know, what, whatever you're talking about, you just have to make sure that you're being responsible. Yeah, I totally agree. Yeah, absolutely. It, it's one of the, one of the um, I, I probably should have showed the, the, the last individual. His name is Il Spoke, and he actually runs an a, a open mic night in, in Manhattan. And he literally said just that. He basically was like, you know, what we talk about is important, and we have to make sure what we're saying, you know, that we're, that we're basically going to own up to. So, and, and because of that, he feels you can do whatever you wish. Like, if you want to do the Drake thing, yeah. stay in your lane. And that's, that's cool. Like, music. music is music. But at the same time, he also said, but don't say some wildness that you can't either co-sign or, or just, like you said, be irresponsible. If, you, if you're you talking about, like, you know, God forbid, like raping someone or, some, or you know, something like that, like, that's that's just no point. That's not about, like, you know, so you have to be responsible to a certain degree. But. Yeah, as a person, as an individual, you have to stand for something. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So whatever you want to say, it is to be in line with that. Yeah. yeah. Anyone else? Yes? I think it's partly about realizing your power as an individual. Um, with all that information that you have and all that access that you have to reach people across the 
road that you've never even met, and have a conversation with someone in Twitter and to say, oh, when you're in New York, come, come link, link up. It's the power of yourself to realize that you are an NPC and that you can reach whatever heights you want to reach. It's how you use and how you sort of develop your vision as a creative person to get there. And there's no, you sh there shouldn't be any more lim like limitations. You shouldn't feel limited anymore. And, and, and that's why I was sharing the stories, you know, when I was with Chico and, and, and his, or Chico and his crew and in Brazil, because all of those tools, both crews have and are using. So I think the only, I think if, if, I, if we're gonna say advantage that maybe I have being kind of in the Western world or specifically being in the United States is, like I said, I've had the, I've had the fortune of two things. One, hip hop started where I'm from, which means that the history is a little bit longer, so I don't have to convince as many people about hip hop. They're kind of already used to it. My challenge though is, is to how can I make my hip hop sound different than the last 35 years? So that's the different challenge. But I don't have to, I, the, 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 I think the challenge that, especially from what I've seen since I've been in Harare is, you guys are still at the phase of getting people to understand what hip hop is, getting more people into hip hop. There's, there's still a lot of people in Zimbabwe, or in Harare at least, that are like, hip hop? Well, I mean, that's the stuff that the Americans do, right? That's the, the, the bling stuff, whatever. So that's, that's your guys' challenge. But again, like I said, the great equalizer to me is, you guys have the same tools that I have, so the potential for you to be able to have that impact is, is there. I don't know how long it would take, and I think that's the tough part, especially as an artist. Um, sometimes you feel like you only have a certain amount of time, or you know, whatever, whatever you feel. But I would say that if you continue to go at it, I mean, it's taken me, I started, I started doing tours overseas about four years ago. So it took me almost, I think I, my first, first time I actually can say I was recording was like 18. So it took me almost 12 years to get to the point I'm at now. So that took years and years and years of being on corners, ciphering, being at open mics, doing showcases for nothing. I still do showcases for free um, in, in places in the United States. Um, so it, it wasn't an overnight process to get to the point I'm, I'm at. Um, but I think that the newer generations of hip hop that are coming up after me are gonna have it a little bit easier just from the standpoint of all of these tools are gonna become greater and most importantly, with time, just like in the United States, because what people don't realize about the history of hip hop was, for the first 20 years, it was the same here as it was in Harare. Most people didn't know what hip hop was. Again, like I was saying before, if you were outside of a city, you wasn't, there were no radio stations that played hip hop in the suburbs. There was an MTV in 1988, 89, that was playing hip hop other than Yo MTV raps, and cable wasn't something that was like widely spread even in the United States. It seems weird to, to hear that, but it's the truth. So hip hop took a time to kind of become this thing that became sort of a household name to people. And now that it's being spread all over the world, it's gonna kind of take a similar amount of time. Not, not to the same, it's not gonna take 20 years, obviously, but it's, it's just a matter of time, basically. Oh, yeah. Uh, it's not just that people don't know about hip hop. We also have an issue of legislation and policy. There's so much control on uh, what people are channeling out through media and uh, all other forms of media. So that's also one major issue. I think it's not that people don't know, but, do know, but it's policy and legislation. Yeah, and, and I, I, you know, yeah, I, I realize that too. Uh, um, that's probably another huge challenge, um, or not probably, that is a huge challenge that, um, again, uh, I have the fortune and other countries have the fortune um, of not having to worry about as much. Um, when my nation is upset about me talking about it or the persecution of it, it's probably not the same as in other places in the world. Um, I know that I have individual friends of mine that are Palestinian poets. I know that the, the subject that they speak about, they can't go to Israel and openly speak about without repercussions for those things. Um, but they're again fortunate enough that they're Palestinian, but they live in the United States. I think it's different for those Palestinian artists that are basically in um, the, those areas of the world um, that are dealing with certain regimes that might not like what potentially would be coming out of the mouths of their artists. Um, but, I, but I would say this is maybe a, an offer of hope or, or, or maybe just uh, encouragement. In the, in the history of all music, 
the best music, the strongest music, doesn't necessarily have to have been political, but the best and strongest music has always come in places and times that have been the most oppressive. That seems to be a drive. So if, if anything, I would suspect that probably some of the best stuff that I'm going to hear over the next decade or more is probably going to come from some place or some area that is dealing with serious issues, whether they be political, economic, or otherwise. Um, so that, that might be just the motivation to continue to make the more creative use to kind of um, inspire people to really pay attention and listen. So, yeah. Um, so do, do we, yeah. Okay, thank you guys very much.